Welcome to Beyond the Screen, an Ionis podcast, where we share insights and tips to help you scale your business's online presence. Hosting genuine conversations with the best in the web and IT industry and exploring how the Ionis brand can help professionals and customers with their hosting and cloud issues. I'm your host, Joe Nash. Welcome to another episode of Beyond the Screen, an Ionis podcast. Joining us today is Vanessa Generelli, principal of Fortuna, a consultancy firm that helps business teams align with change quickly and easily, and chief operating officer at WorkBrew. An instructional designer by training, Vanessa has worked with names including Mozilla, Stella, and P2P University. Before joining GitHub, where as senior director, she guided GitHub Education through the acquisition by Microsoft. In October 2023, Vanessa released Surviving Change at Work, a book that aims to offer expertise and tips to those who are experiencing any kind of change at work, product pivots, staff turnover, software transfers, and so on. When she's not doing that, she's a member of board, she's a member of the board of directors at Circadian, the first state-licensed higher education program teaching circus skills in the United States, and invests in small Philadelphia businesses through the circle of aunts and uncles, a group dedicated to supporting local entrepreneurs. Vanessa, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me, Joe. I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah, so let's kick off talking about your career. As you know, whenever we do these bios, we have this huge list of amazing accolades and titles, and yours is no different. Um, so, you know, I'd like to start by talking about, uh, you know, your work as a consultant with Fortuna. Uh, what is, you know, you help these, you help companies navigate change, and we'll be talking about your books soon. But what does that mean? What do you primarily do for, the, for these folks? Absolutely. So usually companies bring me in when there's been significant change in the organization. There's been a uh, reduction in force. There has been, uh, as you mentioned, leadership turnover, or even uh, some frustration and morale issues, you know, being told to do more with less, uh, fear and anxiety around AI. Mm-hmm. Uh, anytime where an organization needs uh, to align with change quickly. And what I do through my workshops and through my coaching is help employees understand what it is that they want with their careers and also understand where the company is going at a high level and seeing where there's overlap and what I call alignment. Uh, And that helps the employee see where they want to go with their next step, whether it's with the company or not. And it also uh, uh, helps managers build empathy towards direct reports who may be dealing with a lot of change and Mm -hmm. managers aren't, aren't super uh, equipped in the tech industry with a right. lot of these strategies and tools. Right. Yeah, that makes total sense. So I guess my next question would be, you know, lots of people, you know, you mentioned various personas of worker there, you know, managers and employees and people who may encounter this change. What was, what's been your journey with that change? Like what has led you to these experiences to be in the position you are to, you know, share this, uh, this insights and wisdom? Can you walk us a bit for your professional history today? Absolutely. Well, you mentioned that I am a trained instructional designer. And what happened around 2007, 2008, I was working as a textbook editor. And I thought to myself, you know, I'm editing these workbooks. I'm editing these multiple choice tests. Is this actually helping anyone learn anything? And uh, so I decided to start teaching courses online in my spare time to just figure out how these dynamics worked. And that's when I started partnering with Peer to Peer University this at Mozilla. This was part of the big sort of open everything movement that happened right. around 2008 to 2010, which was really my sort of entree into the tech world was through uh, what at that time felt like a kind of activism, right? right. What, uh, what at that time felt like, uh, you know, getting rid of gatekeepers, uh, democratizing information, raising up voices that hadn't been heard before. So it was really, it was really motivating time. And uh, then through that journey, I I decided to actually learn how people learn new things. Sure. And so I ended up going to Harvard and doing my study around motivation and engagement. I did my research at the MIT Media Lab with Scratch. And there in particular, I worked on features that helped children share <laughs> because kids don't want to share. They, right. uh, they, someone is stealing their ideas. You know, I don't know, you know, with, with your friends and siblings, if you ever split a cookie in half and made them choose which one, right? Like it's the, because, and that's a, um, a, a sort of, uh, heuristic to help kids understand sharing. And we know that that's such important open source behavior. So I worked on features to help uh, promote that sort of behavior and thinking. And now if you use Scratch, 
you can actually see derivatives of your project. So you can see what other people do with it and how that inspired them. So that was that was really fun research. Yeah. Uh, from there, I you know did a stint in the world of digital money and went to Nigeria uh, to see how financial inclusion works and doesn't. Uh, learned a lot about how financial systems work, and eventually a friend of ours tapped me to come teach Git to teachers. And uh, eventually he moved on. Joe and I worked together at GitHub and I became this manager. (laughs) Uh, I presented my plan for my vision for the team to the CEO. And he responded, that's the best presentation I've ever seen at GitHub, but we need to level up your business acumen. And I was like, that is accurate. That is a true <laughs> statement. And so they sent me to Stanford Business School. Uh, and so I got that more sort of right. financial understanding and, and operational understanding. And also, you know, shepherding that team through the transition of, you know, GitHub young and, you know, young and scrappy and very DIY. And we were this mighty team of four people. And seeing all the different ways that have, being part of a larger organization could help the mission of that organization meant that I had to get on board with change real quickly. And notice notice also what breaks as a company goes through its life cycle. So, you know, we went from a very sort of ad hoc, I think you and I did like performance reviews once a year, like yeah. whenever. <laughs> 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 and, um, uh, to a more formalized process where there are promotion packets and there is a promotion committee uh, and salary bans that are very strict, all these sort of formal processes that get implemented as an organization grows up. And so I, I put all those lessons together and stuck them in a book, uh, which is out from a book apart now. And uh, my hope is that it really helps, really helps employees at the sort of line level, line manager level, even director level, get a sense of what they can expect from an organization as it changes. Yeah, absolutely. So, oh God, that's a lot, lot to dig into there. Uh, I mean, first of all, one thing I want to call out on is, uh, you know, I'd known you'd worked on Scratch. I, I hadn't realized hearing you describe having to encourage children to share, especially in the context of Scratch, is like one of those things you hear about and you're like, oh, of course, that's not like a solved problem initially. Yet. But like when you think of Scratch now, the remixing and the sharing of projects is so core to it. It's so fascinating to hear that journey. Um, but to come back to, I guess, you know, the book you just mentioned and that whole, uh, you know, the the whole journey. Uh I guess one question I have about that is like, at what point did you, in the developing of your own expertise and having those experiences, at what point did you go, oh, wait a minute, I need to share this. I need to become, you know, I need to start Fortune. I need to write a book. Like, when did that fall into place for you? Well, there was, you know, in the sort of uh, uh, challenging time of the pandemic, taking a step back and thinking like, what do I want to do with my energy? What do I want to do with my time to serve others? I sort of reflected on three patterns that came up uh, during our our time working together, and in general, uh, you know, fifteen years of experience working in early stage organizations, product mm-hmm. market fit organizations. And the first pattern is that for millennials, are you a millennial, Joe, or do you kind of? I am. I am technically a millennial. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so for for millennials, and actually even more for Gen Z, there's this big tension between money and mission. In right. our work lives, right? Previous generations didn't have that ten- tension because they weren't expected to be bucketed together, right? If, cool. you're, if your dad did 30 years at GE, like <laughs> he, he might uh, uh, get to work on a project or two that had a, that, yeah, a mission component, but that's not, uh, that wasn't sort of the core focus of work. So our expectations of work have shifted. And Deloitte says that two out of five millennials and Gen Z folks have rejected a job assignment because it did not align with their values. And, you know, we want to work on projects that have a positive impact in the world, but in practice, holding that expectation can result in a lot of heartbreak when the company doesn't live up to those ideals. And I noticed that folks would get really attached 
and react emotionally anytime the company changed because of that mission drift that can happen as a company grows up. So as, a, as, as, as an industry, we needed tools to navigate that heartbreak when companies have to make hard choices and choices that conflict with our values. We, we didn't have any, we don't have any right. tools. Yeah. Um, pattern two is that change really hurts. Mm -hmm. And what do I mean by that? Uh, tech moves super fast, but no one teaches us how to do it gracefully, how to adapt gracefully. Uh, and in the book, I build on the work of uh, Harvard OG business scholar, Rosabeth Moskanter, and she's dedicated her life's work to studying the myriad of way, the myriad ways employees feel pain through change. And there are 10 different reasons everywhere from surprise to loss of face to, uh, um, to uh, what were a few others? I could read them for you. <laughs> <laughs> feel free. Feel free. Uh, okay. The, let's see if I can if I can get them. Uh, but no stress okay. if they're not at hand. That's also totally fine. The yeah. So it's loss of control. Yeah. For you know, for a lot of folks, autonomy is their primary driver. Right. And I know that autonomy is important to you. It's definitely right. important to me. So changes in autonomy can rattle mm -hmm. your sense of control. Mm -hmm. uh, excess uncertainty. Right. Nobody likes to be left on red, right? Like that, <laughs> waiting for more details to firm up. Uh, surprise, loss of face, concerns about future competence, ripple effects, mm -hmm. concerns about more work, right? Mm -hmm. Because whenever mm -hmm. there's change, you got to learn how to do it. And right. it's, um, that takes more, you know, some, some of us are motivated to burn the midnight oil and like innovate. Sure. Uh, but some aren't, right? Yeah. So yeah. any change is like, oh, I got to learn how to do something different. And then there's past resentment. Mm -hmm. And I think you and I have both had experiences where for whatever reason, one change breaks the camel's back uh, mm -hmm. of like a, the, the sort of cumulative effect of past changes. And then all of a sudden you've got an eruption in a Slack channel or uh, like gossip or trying to go above someone's head. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, those are, I build on the, the work of Rosabeth Moskanter. Let me. Yeah navigate away from <laughs> you can have my uh my full attention um but the third and last pattern that i would reflect on is that as tech employees we are hired in a specific domain mm -hmm. you do developer outreach in a in this amazing way there and it helps that you're very online joe like that's your <laughs> that's your domain right right but like some folks you know it's marketing product design engineering and you're hired because you're a badass at that thing. Right. But then to succeed in an org, you've got to know all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. You've got to know how to get folks to invest in your ideas, how promotions work. Uh, you're just expected to know how to advocate for yourself. And I wanted to write a book that was like the missing manual for tech employees so they could get a quick overview of the things that they would need to know mm -hmm. to fill in that gap. Right. That makes a lot of sense. So to go back to some points you said there, so you brought up, you know, some aspects in which the tech industry or workers in the tech industry may feel slightly differently about change than, you know, other workplaces, other form of workers. So, you know, the pace is a big one, pace of change, innovation, tech. You also met, I think autonomy, you mentioned autonomy. And I think that's actually, you know, just from my observation that like, there's a higher degree of expectations about having autonomy in, in tech, than I think in other industries. Do you think that like, you know, the prospect of change for a tech employee is fundamentally different than other workers. Do you think there's something that makes change particularly scary to tech to tech workers? Uh, I don't know about particularly scary. I think particularly frequent, as mm -hmm. you observed. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, there, what I think something that's different when I talk to my friends in other industries, there is a lot of tension between the, the sort of line workers and management. Right. And I think the power differentials are a bit different in tech mm -hmm. because everyone is so smart mm -hmm. and like they, they know they can take their business elsewhere. Right. right? Like the, at any employee at any given time in a tech role, like their skills could be very much in demand somewhere else. Right. So uh, I think a better way to think about uh, 
it is an employee and also also is a manager, even at the C-suite, is you know that you can't get things done if the employees aren't on board and they are likely going to be smart people. So if you want things done at a high level, you're going to need to socialize your ideas with the rank and file and employees can decide whether they want to take a step forward with that vision or not and take their business elsewhere. And so that's a power that I think is unique to this industry that might not, that isn't, you know, say if you're a, you know, a film scholar with tenure at like Bryn Mawr or mm-hmm. Imperial, that's a very um, narrow focus. And because capitalism being what it is, there is a, there's a different demand for those sure. particular skills and expertise. Yeah. So uh, also earlier stage organizations haven't ossified their policies mm-hmm. yet. So there's a lot of slack in it. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of younger employees may want clarity where there is none right. or a process where there is none. And uh, the the upside is you can totally shape it. You know, when you and I worked together, I was like, hey, what should, what should our policy on this be? I'm taking ideas. <laughs> 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 because it's so much easier also to build with Mm -hmm. all the smart people on your team, then just roll out a policy and have a smart person like Joan Ash just rail against it in a public (laughs) channel. Um, So it's smarter for a Not that I've ever done that, of course. (laughs) (laughs) You feel free to edit that out, Joe. (laughs) (laughs) No, we're good. Um, So really, I think the, you know, the point about um, the... Uh, not to be too dramatic, but like the balance of power, the you know the the extent to which the worker has other options, and you know supply and demand, that's really interesting. And I think one of the ways, or one of the one of the you know big things that has changed for the industry as a whole in recent years, so obviously with the pandemic, has been that balance seems to be shifting or has shifted a bit. You know, we're seeing this play out in we're remote now. Everyone's being called back to work, and you know there's various conflicts about that, and various businesses, you know, businesses are navigating that. Um, how do you think the pandemic has the word change is really getting a lot of um a lot of use in this podcast, but you know, how do you think the pandemic has has altered how businesses communicate change to employees and how they how they address these substantial changes everyone's had to go through to to their workforces? Yeah. So uh in the in the book, I introduced my own change framework for leaders who will need to roll out change to their organizations. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's kind of like agile change management because usually, I mean, Joe, I don't know if you ever worked at an organization that had like change management and scare quotes from a, from um, like a big four consulting firm. Yeah, my, the, uh, my NGO time. <laughs> yes. Oh, your NGO time. Okay, yeah, yeah, so yeah. That, that's like a, like hundreds of thousands of dollars contract yeah. and it takes forever and that's not going to work for our industry, uh, the tech industry. So um, I introduced this framework, it's called Amicus mm-hmm. and it's about assessing the variables that you're trying to move, metrics, timeline, uh, incremental change is easier to implement uh, comms, putting together a communication plan, us integrating employees with the change and show what when, once the change is over, again, in scare quotes, showing employees the impact oh. that the change has had. And what I will say about the pandemic and change is that there's definitely been a ton of it. And let me point to some examples of folks who have done it well, at least mm-hmm. the communications part well. And Brian Chesky at Airbnb wrote this blog post that really clearly articulated why he chose to have a a reduction in force. Mm -hmm. And it was because bookings dropped this much. So revenue dropped this much. So they needed to go back into the black. So they were culling all of their sort of growth verticals, experimental verticals, just really doubling back down on the, you know, the host experience and the guest experience. And I'm happy to put that blog post in the show notes for you. Uh, but it's really, I think, an amazing case study in connecting that and how, how leaders should connect the dots. Like, hey, this thing happened that it was out that, you know, economic conditions, change in market demand. Here are the inputs that I think are going to make a change. And then here is what I expect to see as a result. And uh, the Collison brothers did something similar when they had a reduction in force uh, at Stripe, where they really clearly uh, articulated, hey, we thought we were going to grow and that didn't happen. And that's on us. 
but here is what we're going to do at Stripe and what we're going to focus on. And here is the profitability that we expect to see in the next, in the coming quarters. So uh, those, those would be my, my, some of the patterns that I've noticed. Right. Yeah. Um, I also think that unfortunately during this time, HR tends to be an under-resourced function in mm -hmm. organizations that are early stage or product market fit or even at, at scale. And a lot of these tools um, aren't necessarily available because when you're cutting budgets. So when I give workshops to managers, I point to four variables that will improve for those managers. The first is, the question is, I am dreading upcoming changes at my company. Mm -hmm. And before a workshop and after, people feel way closer to know I feel okay about them. So they dread change less. Right. Second is, I feel prepared for company changes. They feel more prepared. They know how to measure the impact of changes that they make to their team. And probably the, the, the variable that improves the most consistently after I've been doing these workshops with folks like Pluralsight and Netlify is I know how to message change to my team. And that, you know, the pre-workshop mean is usually six-ish and the post-workshop mm -hmm. mean is 8.5-ish. Mm -hmm. So uh, if those are the ability to approach change with less dread, prepare your managers, measure change and message change, if those are business outcomes that your organization needs, that is something that the workshops provide. But I also uh, assist companies one on one with one on one coaching of their managers during this time. Say a team is going to, they know they're going to prepare for a reduction in force. This is if they need help uh, scoping it, making a plan and a timeline, if they need to help messaging that change, that is also uh, a service I provide. So, you know, throughout your professional history, um, and even, you know, now at WorkBrew, you know, you've worked on remote and distributed teams, which is obviously, you know, in this current moment, as we just discussed, as things a lot of people are navigating, what advice would you give folks who are, you know, either currently leading teams or looking to uh, accommodate, you know, the push towards flexible working and remote working in creating a successful, you know, work environment, but also culture within those very, like, distributed spaces? Yeah. So um, I think expectations are really important when it comes to remote work. And a lot of folks focus on like the sort of fun, like make the team have emojis or, uh, you know, send them sparkles or swag or whatever. Um, and I'm not going to poo poo on those. Like I'm not going to yuck that yum, but I feel like that's more frosting or icing on the cake versus the structure that you should build with teams. And especially for new team members, you as a manager need to set up every employee with a 30, 60, 90 day plan. Mm -hmm. Actually, let me rephrase that. As a manager, it is extremely beneficial to both you and the direct report to come up with a 30, 60, 90 day plan. And I think that this is on the manager's responsibility to do the first one because they know what people they right. should meet in the first 30 days, the uh, projects they should work on. And the, the structure of the 30, 60, 90 is uh, see one, do one, try one, right? And at 30 days, you're probably going to want to, it's really about imbibing information. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and at uh, 60 days, you're analyzing that information and formulating a plan. And at 90 days, you're implementing that plan. And after every quarter, rinse and repeat, just keep doing that. There are only right. four quarters in a year. It's not that <laughs> it's not that intense, but uh, it's also a really if if the direct report is like looks at it and says, OK, that, that seems reasonable because both parties need to handshake on the on the right. 30, 60, 90 day plan uh, as far as like the commitments that are made uh, at 30 days. You're going to have a sense of whether that's going well or not. Uh, 60 days. You will definitely know in 90 days if that is if this person needs more support. Uh, but I think I hear a lot from individuals who, are, who say, you know, I, I feel alone. I don't know what to work on. I don't know mm -hmm. who to talk to. And there are so many problems can be addressed with just a little clarity. Right. Uh, the second sort of the second piece is folks got to see each other in person. Um, there, There's a reason why in so many cultures, breaking bread is the, uh, you know, ritual. And 
I made it a point, you know, whenever someone new would come on to the team, especially if they were a manager or a leader, is I would fly out and see how they lived, right? Like the the folks who live in Amsterdam have a different pace of life and pattern of life and expectations than the folks who live in San Francisco. They have mm-hmm. different cultural touch points. Their, their relationships with their family may be a bit different. And uh, so I, I, I recommend making, uh, making that effort. Roll it into a team offsite. Right. Just figure out figure out how to get those those folks together. Uh, and three, um, never skip your one on ones. Just don't skip them. Uh, this is maybe number four, and you're not going to like this, Joe. Is um, <laughs> get get aligned with your team members about where they want to go in their career. Mm-hmm. The so I asked every I ask every team member to put together their career plan. It's very very quick and dirty. It's not. Uh, you have to name three people whose careers you admire, reverse engineer it, set some gaps what you want to fill. And that way, it's another way of aligning the, right. the manager and the direct report. So when that person wants to make a move, no one's surprised. Sure. And it builds a ton of trust. Yeah. So there, there are these solid communication and expectation mechanisms that, yeah. you know, uh, all the other sort of fringe benefits or uh, uh you know, they are decorative, but I think that if you get these sort of fundamentals right, that'll take yeah. you pretty far. That last one's especially interesting what you said there about, you know, preparing for them to make a change. I guess it's kind of like internal change management to the team as well as stuff coming down from them. Um it's, it's, yeah, that's pretty yeah, I you know, having having worked on teams who've exercised those things, I think I would agree with all those points. Um <laughs> including the one that gave me a life crisis when at the age of twenty five you're like, what do you want to do in the future, Joe? And I'm like, oh uh so yeah, totally totally understand and agree um so as we get to the end of our time here we have a bit of a tradition uh here on the show you know especially of our our guests who have such illustrious careers which to ask you know if you could give some advice to yourself at the start of your career what would that advice be well the uh follow your intuition Mm -hmm. there is um I'm very fortunate in that I have led a life where I could follow ideas and mm-hmm. follow the the question that seemed most alive to me at the time. And whenever I've had an intuition that like, hey, this team doesn't like this doesn't feel right. Uh, it's it's usually been correct. Uh, and also, if if you see an opportunity, try it. Just try it. Just try it um, The because you don't know what you're going to be super good at in the work mm-hmm. world yet early in your career. You could be really persuasive in front of an audience. You just don't know. You could uh, be excellent at navigating hacker news, uh, you know, or help you. Uh, <laughs> but try, try a lot of different, different things um, and step into roles that might be uncomfortable for you because you can always move back. Um, you can always roll it back. If we could only just like have Git for our careers. <laughs> what a dream. I know. Bran- branching every day. <laughs> uh, yeah, those, those, those two pieces, I think. Perfect. Well, I think that is a wonderful point to put a full stop on it. Thank you so much for your time today, Vanessa. It's been uh, wonderful to have your insights here on the show. It has been my pleasure. Beyond the Screen, an Ionis podcast. To find out more about Ionis and how we're the go-to source for cutting-edge solutions in web development, visit ionis.com and then make sure to search for Ionis in Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Google Podcasts or anywhere else podcasts are found. Don't forget to click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Ionis, thanks for listening.